also extend Chris and greeting this morning. It's a blessing to be here. And uh, I didn't hear that verse quoted where two or three are gathered in my name. There I will be also, but uh, it felt a little bit. That verse felt proper this morning, didn't it? And uh, we had a very good discussion in class. was blessed to be there, to be here. As far as announcements, um, this evening is open here. Wednesday evening is uh, letter stuffing, Trenton's, Jared, and Barb for food, drinks. And then CBS is in need of help cleaning November 13th through 15th. Uh, church house cleaning this week. There's also a Richards and Barb's and uh, communion on October 29th coming up. Also, there's a carry-in planned after services. Before I forget, um, everybody's welcome to stay for that, for the entire, everybody that's here. Are there any other announcements or prayer requests? Okay, if not, uh, let's stand together for a prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege again of being able to come to your house to worship you in this way, Father. We thank you for good nights, rest of sleep, for health and strength. The many blessings that we take for granted, Father, we, we thank you. We know that you are the sustainer of life and the giver of life, and we honor you for it, and we praise you, your name for it. And help us, Father, to realize that someday we will not live here on this earth, but we will leave this earth, and, and the bodies that we have are temporary, and uh, that this is not our home here on this earth. So help us to ever keep this mindful for ourselves and also to express this to others, that there is a day coming where uh, we will either be in heaven or hell. Help us to, to keep this in our minds, Father. We thank you for your word that teaches us and that guides us in the truth. We thank you. And, all, Father, we just pray for Dave now as he brings us a word that you would undergird him and strengthen him, Father, to, to bring that which we have lack of and, and encourage us where we have need in, Lord. We thank you. And also, Father, for those that are traveling this morning, that are worshiping elsewhere. We pray that you would protect them spiritually and physically and, and you would keep them in your care. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Extend a welcome to each one that's here this morning. There are probably... <clears throat> Things that, as pastors, we never say much. This isn't starting out well. Anyway. <clears throat> but there's, there's a, a verse in Scripture that talks about the foolishness of preaching, and sometimes that's exactly how we feel. The foolishness of it all. And as I was studying, I had, for some other reason, that thought kept coming through. And you know how it is we, we always, we try to justify things by putting the blame on, putting the weight of that on someone else's shoulder. And so before, I've been preaching through Ephesians and I'm ready for chapter 3. So before I start there, just a couple questions I want to ask you as a church. <clears throat> And you've been asked before why you come to church. Why do you come to church? But, you know, we're only here for a short time on this earth. You, you may look, you may be a young man with young children on your laps, and you may think, well, I have X amount of years yet. I am, I'm okay. And then there's some of us who know and feel the progression of age, 
<clears throat> you know, that, that clock is ticking. And, you know, yet we don't even know what today holds, how long our time will be. And I don't, I don't want to just come up here. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm not sure what happened. <clears throat> I, I don't want to just be here and take up a time slot. You know, we're, we're given a span of time as pastors, be here. And our goal isn't just to fill up that 20, 25 minutes. That's not our, our goal or our purpose. Neither is that your goal in life or your purpose in life. It's just to take up that 70 years that God may bless you with here if, if it's that long. Neither is it an endurance test. Maybe this morning sitting here is an endurance test. I don't know. But neither is life an endurance test. It is a life to be lived with zeal and joy and purpose. Going back to my original thought, does what is shared here today matter? You have multiple opportunities to learn today. The devotions that Richard shared this morning... <clears throat> your Sunday school class that you were in, hopefully you participated, and the message. Does it even matter what shared? Does it even matter what you heard? Does it matter an hour from now, a day, a week, a month, a year? Does what you take in today, does it matter? Does it make a difference in your life? What's the purpose of being here? If it doesn't, what's the purpose of being here? Whose fault is it? Is the fault up here? Or is it on that padded seat down there? Just, just a thought. And I don't know where this comes from. I guess maybe, um, maybe it's because I didn't want to be up here. <clears throat> so does what happens here matter? And it does. It matters when it causes a change when it creates a change what causes that change there has to be that fertile soil there has to be um, that heart that is open and receptive all that I guess to give me an out so anyway Ephesians 3 verse 1 <clears throat> and I think I'll read the first six verses of Ephesians chapter 3 For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now there's <clears throat> a lot of information in this passage here. If we look at verse 1, <clears throat> the New King James Version says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, for this reason, in the light of, because of, the message he was sharing is what got him put into prison because of jealousy, because of envy, because of the Jews not wanting to hear the message he had. In Ephesians 1, if we look back, it says, for this reason or for this cause. So we need to look back at what he shared before this. So if we look at, at, at Ephesians 1, which... It's been two or three months since I shared on that. But it's God's work of redemption. <clears throat> and then a prayer for the church for wisdom and knowledge and understanding. If we look at that uh, chapter. Ephesians 2 talks about reconciliation of man on an individual level and then also as a body, as a church. Paul talks about the church and God's love for the church, his redemptive power for the church. And, and how 
Christ, when Christ came, he broke down that middle wall of partition. We look at Peter in Acts 10. That, that middle wall of partition was broken, and not only did Peter get that message, I mean, not only did Paul get that message, but Peter did also in Acts 10. And you remember the episode where he was on a rooftop and he was, he was hungered, and, and God let down a, a basket or, or something with all sorts of what the Jews would have considered unclean animals. And he was told to kill and to eat. But in his Jewish mind, they were unclean. But he was revealed to him that, that yeah, in Christ, it is all clean. <clears throat> so that is uh, a message that, that Christ came. He, he broke down that middle wall of partition. In verse 14, in chapter 2, it says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down that middle wall of partition between us. He's referring to the Jews and the Gentiles. And we know today in what we're experiencing in, in the world stage between um, Israel and the nations around them, there is still somehow that, that, that wall of animosity that is there that has, has just traveled through the ages is, is still there. But as Christians, and in studying, I read this in one of my study guides, the early Christians would have considered themselves a third race, neither Jew, neither Gentile, but Christians. It was, there was no more a dividing line between the two, um, the two races. The second part of verse 1 talks about the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now, <clears throat> we think about why Paul was a prisoner. He could have said he is a prisoner of Rome, because the Romans are the ones that had him under house arrest. They're the ones that had, you know, uh, soldiers there guarding him, making sure he didn't leave. But no, he had, he had a proper perspective of, of this in that he says he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. It's because of his work, his preaching for Christ that he was put in prison. He didn't put the blame on the Romans, but he took upon himself being that um, prisoner for Christ. Not because of anything he had done wrong, not because he, he was a murderer or a thief or, or had broken laws or was fraudulent, but because he had done that which God had called him to do. And I, I don't know about you, but my mom often told me um, if I would complain about something, she would say, well, just remember, life isn't fair. So we could think that about, Paul could have thought that. Life isn't fair. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm unjustly uh, accused. But it was because of his missionary endeavors to the Gentiles that had brought, he had brought him upon this. And, you, you know, we, we do that sometimes in life today. We take this, we bring this down to our setting and, and, and our, our personal life. And I may face something uncomfortable. I may face something difficult, horrible, painful, however you may say it. And, and we blame it. We like to put a blame on things. That's just our, our human nature is, is, is just, to, just to blame somebody or something and to mourn over it and to, to make sure everybody knows about it. And yet, <clears throat> that's not what Paul did here. Paul applied it exactly. He had the right perspective. It was because of his missionary endeavors. It was because of Christ that he was a prisoner. It wasn't because of the Romans. It wasn't because of the Jews. It was because of Christ. There are difficult things that we experience in life. And, and, and when I thought of this, I immediately thought of Norman Sarah and, and what she's faced in her um, health travels, journey. And yet, I have seldom heard Sarah complain. Seldom. Not that she couldn't have. And you could see the difficulties often etched on her face. And I hope you don't mind me saying this, Sarah. I'm sorry. I didn't give you a warning. And yet, it's, 
it's the, the taking that which isn't fair and allowing God to use that in her life or in your life, whatever you're facing, with a humble heart, that is then it is from God. It is something that, that uh, you know, life just isn't fair. There's, there's, we talked about it in Sunday school. There is illness. We live in a fallen world, and there are just things that take place. And when we, when we give it to God, when we allow God to take that and use it, um, it's, it's much better. I think we can, we can learn from this in that Paul was writing from captivity. And it wasn't, I think, if I read correctly, it wasn't necessarily that he was in a dungeon, a dark, dirty dungeon, but he was under house arrest. And uh, he was writing this, this letter. There was four books, if I can remember. Uh, yeah, I wrote them down here. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon that were especially uh, attributed to this time. And if he would have been focused on his own situation, on his own trials, on the injustice of that he was facing, do you think he could have written the encouraging letters that he did to these churches? I don't think he could. And that, that's kind of convicting to me because so often... I focus on what is wrong, what is, what is wrong with what is happening in my own life, what is wrong with what's happening around me or on the world stage, instead of focusing on how God can use that. <clears throat> uh, often I complain instead of, be, instead of being thankful or, or joyful. And um, I just, that turns into, more often it turns into self-pity or, or self-abasement in that I, re- I remember, I don't know, the younger generation here may not remember it, but when Linda was still alive, Linda Hirschberger, Mel would often, not often, but I heard him say that as difficult as that was as a father to walk with his daughter through that, there are many times that he had an opportunity in hospitals, nursing homes, and, and other places, he had an opportunity to share about God's love because of Linda's illnesses. I don't know, does anybody here remember him sharing that. I few, see a few hands and heads nod. You know, th- those, those, we look at that in perspective looking back and we say, yeah, that was great. But it was no easier then for the parents of Linda than it is for you and I no matter what we face. It was a perspective that, that Mel had to, to, uh, to not focus on himself or on Linda's illness, but to focus on the opportunities that it brought about in his life, to, to share God's love to those that were around him. And it's probably something I'll, I'll remember for many, many years. <clears throat> you know, and, and that, I think that goes for, for all of us here, whether, you, you know, Paul here said in verse 1, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm a prisoner of that. Today, none of us may be facing prison or an illness or something like that, but I am a father. Maybe you're a father unto Christ Jesus. You're, you have young children, and, and you're, you're, you say, well, I'm, I'm a parent. That's my place right now. But if we would, if we'd say that, that I'm a parent unto Christ, I'm parenting these children unto Christ, it's something I'm doing for Christ. Or maybe you're a grandparent here this morning, or a teacher, I see a teacher here. Um, or maybe you're just swinging a hammer or stacking veggies or whatever it is that you do. But it's, it's, if we take that perspective that Paul had in this situation as, as dull and monotonous as those um, projects or work activities can be, if we, if we can apply it or use it for God's glory, that is what Paul was doing here. And, and I, I can take, um, I can be convicted in that. I get tired of swinging a hammer. I get tired of being a father. I get tired of always being taken from or drawn from and and yet when I look at it differently I look at it through the eyes of what Christ would have me do in this situation or this circumstance I think it would help me a lot 
Uh, I want to read in Acts in thinking about his situation here. I think this reveals to us where Paul was at this time. Acts 28, verse 30 and 31. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So we, we see his setting at this time when he's writing uh, these uh, books. <clears throat> Paul had two years. He had two years. He would have rather been visiting these churches. You could say he had two years. He had an opportunity to write these books that he may not have taken if it wouldn't have been for being in prison. And I think if we we would take that same context, if if I take the the opportunities that God gives me because of the difficult circumstances I'm in or in spite of the opportunities I have because of the situation and in spite of my own feelings, if I would take those opportunities and, and use them for God's glory. We look, we look down through the ages, uh, through history, and, and see Paul's writings and the benefit it has been to the church as a whole, um, known as what they call the prison epistles. And we can understand God's purpose in Paul being in prison. Does it help me understand the purpose that God, when God puts me through difficult circumstances, does it help me understand that? Maybe not. But I can can glean encouragement from that. A couple verses in Philippians. Philippians 1. Um talks about, my headline here in my Bible says, Paul's boldness in prison. And I just pick out a few verses here. Uh, of, we understand Paul's thought process on this, this whole thing. Verse 12, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Isn't that our goal, ultimately? Even, even though it's difficult to follow through with, I think that's where um, our mind should be. Verse 19, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Verse 21, one that we read often, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is often um, Paul's uh, testimony there. It's, it doesn't matter what happened to him in that prison, whether for him to live or for him to die. It, either way is a gain. Moving on to verse 2, looking at the word dispensation, and Paul says that this was given to him. It's a dispensation that was given to him. And I, I looked up the Greek in that, and it has to do with administration and stewardship. So it's something that was entrusted to him to, to do with, to give, to pass on. It wasn't something to hoard and to keep. And that is um, that mystery that he talks about here. In verses 3 to 5, talks a lot about that mystery and, and uh, wonder what that mystery was, how much it was talked about in other books of Scripture. I found some in Matthew, Matthew 13. And the disciples came to Jesus here and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And this is how Christ answered that. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not given. And then Matthew thirteen seventeen. For I verily say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. To him that hath ears, let him hear. In essence, Christ is saying here that uh, if, you, if we read on there, basically it's, it's obedience to to 
To understand something further, I have to initially obey what I already know or what has been revealed to me. So for me to understand it, for me to have it revealed to me, I need to understand and obey what I already know. And I think that's, um, in a lot of life, it's that way. For me to understand something completely, um, I don't understand, you know, finance. Maybe I don't understand finances to a level I should until I, until I follow through with some initial steps. And then I see how finances work. And I'm just using that for an example. And that's, that's how sometimes Scripture is. I don't understand it until I follow through and obey that which, which I know, that which is already revealed. And looking at verse 6, I think this is kind of a, a highlight of this passage. And this is when Paul reveals what that mystery is. Verse 5, he talks about it was not made known earlier, but is now revealed that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. If we look at that phrase, that, that's pretty inflammatory. If we think about the setting that he's in, um, we think of the Jews allowing the Gentiles into their church, into their body. Um, it, was, it was quite a process for a Gentile to become a Jew, and yet they weren't even called Jews. They had another word for them. And yet they were still considered, even if they went through the, all the ceremony, they were still considered a second-rate Jew. They were never completely um, in the know or in, in, in the group. Um, there's examples in the, in the Old Testament of when non-Jews joined the Jews. And um, we think of Exodus. In the Exodus from Egypt... We read there in, in chapter 12, and it says, A mixed multitude went up also with them. So this is, the mul this is a multitude that believed, possibly because of the miracles, uh, the plagues, I say miracles, the plagues that were done to Egypt there, and they saw in the Jews a God greater than the gods and the idols they served there. It says, A mixed multitude went up also with them. That may have been part of the issue in the wilderness. I'm not sure. I'm just expressing my own thoughts there. Also in uh, Esther. In Esther, when the Jews were given the right to defend themselves against their enemies. Esther 8.17, it says, In every providence, in every city, whithersoever the king's command and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness and a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. So it was the witness, it was a testimony of a God that was stronger than the idols they served at the time, and they became Jews. <clears throat> and we look at back at the promise of God to Abraham in Genesis 22, 17 and 18. This is what God said to, to Abraham that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And we go to that, that covenant or that promise that God made with Abraham there. And what was the purpose of that? If we look at it, God was going to bless Abraham and his seed, but it comes down to the last sentence. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. There was a purpose in God's blessing Abraham. It wasn't just for Abraham. It just wasn't for his posterity. It was so that the world could be blessed. Galatians talks about that in chapter 3, verse 14, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It's, it's that promise that was given to Abraham is passed down to us, the Gentiles, through Jesus Christ. There's, there's no need for that ceremonialism of becoming a Jew, but we, we have that third race, as some of the early church stated, that as Christians, we become a family, a, a body. 
If we look at verse 6, the last part, um, there's it's through the gospel. Oh, let me see where this is. Oh, by the gospel. It says, promise in Christ by the gospel. Not by becoming a Jew. Um, and you, can you imagine how difficult this is for the Jews at that time when everything was very structured? It's very difficult for them to accept this. And I think we can understand that um, difficulty when we go back to Acts 15. And this is when um, they met. They call it the Jerusalem Council in chapter 15. And I'm not going to read much of this. But the Jerusalem Council met, and <clears throat> that was the discussion, was do the Gentiles need to go through the process of becoming a Jew to be part of the church? Verse 5 says, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise and commanded them to keep the law of the Moses. So it was law of Moses and circumcision. That was the sticking point. So that was why they came together. So this was not something that, that just passed over lightly or, or, uh, or was no big deal. This was a change. It was a drastic change from what they were accustomed to. Verse 10 says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? I think that's, that's a good answer um, for that very thought. It's, it's, it's a yoke that they're barely able to bear, and yet they're willing to place that same yoke upon someone that's coming from a different culture and, 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 and wanting to become part of the church. It's asking that question, um, why are you wanting to yoke them up with something that we can barely maintain ourselves? If we look back at verse 6, <clears throat> In Ephesians 3, there's three phrases in that verse that I'd like to focus on just a little bit. Three ideas, you would say, that, that are mentioned in this verse. Um, does anybody want to take a stab at what three they are? Okay, I think uh, Richard had the same issue this morning also. Uh, fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise. There are th three phrases in there that basically tie the two Jew and Gentile together. What, it, what is the significance of this? Um, I have a couple verses I'll read later on, but how does it depict the relationship between... Um, Jews and Gentiles. I think it depicts it in a way that um, there's, not a, there's no longer that div division, no longer that wall. It's, that wall has been broken. There's, these three are somewhat nouns. I'm not a teacher, but I think they are, they're nouns. They're descriptive. So they're heirs of what? Members of what? And partakers of what? So in thinking about that, I want to read several verses uh, be in Romans and Galatians, 1 Corinthians. And I have these printed out, so I'm not going to turn to them. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So an heir is someone who is adopted into a family, and then heirs of God. So we are 
children of God together with the Jews. There's no longer that separation. Galatians 4, 5 says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. No longer a servant, no longer a slave, but we have become a son, son of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So that's the second phrase, the same body. So there's, no, there's not a, a church of Jews and a church for the Gentiles, though even today there's a Jewish church that a neighbor of mine goes to in, in uh, Columbus. <clears throat> it's, it was, they're not Jewish as in they don't keep the, but they're believing Jews. So it's still a body, one body, whether you're a Jew or not. Members of one body. And then the last phrase is partakers of his promise in Christ. So we're partakers of the promise of Christ. There's that Christ, that redemption, that lamb was sent initially to the Jews. But as Gentiles, we are also partakers in that doesn't just apply uh, to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. There's no, no difference, uh, ethnic, uh, race, economic barriers, uh, black, white, whether you're thinking of the divisions in countries right now, whether we're from the West or Russia, Chinese. As a Christian, those barriers all get laid down. I'm going to read a story about Corey Ten Boom that I think portrays this very well. Corey was the daughter of a watchmaker in Holland. During World War II, she and her family hid Jews in their house to protect them from the Nazis. Corey and her sister Betsy were taken prisoners while Ravensbrook, to Ravensbrook. While there, they were seriously mistreated, and Betsy passed away. After the war was over, Corey was freed, and God led her to travel around and talk about forgiveness trying to bring healing to a broken land. While in one church sharing about forgiveness, to her horror, she saw one of the guards, one of her guards from Ravensbrook in the congregation. Afterward, he came up to her. He wanted to know if it was really true that she could forgive and that God could forgive. He told her he was a guard at Ravensbrook, not knowing that she had remembered who he was. Then he reached out his hand and asked for forgiveness. For Corey, the time seemed to stand still. Her body was paralyzed. The man in front of her had been cruel and evil, and her sister had died. She knew she should forgive, and that is what she had been teaching about. But facing the actual guard who did those things was her most difficult thing she could imagine. Teaching others about forgiveness was easier than practicing herself. Finally, after a silent prayer asking for help, from the Lord, she was able to extend her hand and offer forgiveness. Warmth and love filled both hearts, especially that of the guard. Embracing him, she told him that she did forgive him. And I think that's the story that we see uh, brought out in this passage here, verses 1 through 6. There is no difference. We are called upon by God to forgive and and where enemies, once enemies, can become fellow heirs. As verse 6 says, we should be fellow heirs, the same body, and partakers of the same promise. There is, there is that broken, that wall of partition has been broken down, and it's easy to talk about. It's difficult to put in practice. And let's pray for each other as we attempt to do that. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we... Thank you for these letters from Paul and how they can um, affect us today, how they can 